My name is Andrew Kennedy. I usually go by Kit, so feel free to call me that. But I'm going to be talking to you today um, mostly, or a fair bit, on our, the flight software architecture for our CubeSat named Murata. But I'm also going to be talking a little bit about an another topic as well, which I've incorporated in here, um, scaling CubeSat flight software to uh, cooperative constellations. Um, so I'll just leap right into it. First, I'm going to talk about uh, my purpose and motivation, um, and then the Murata flight software architecture um, and scaling up to a CubeSat constellation, and finally, my conclusions. Um, so the purpose and motivation for this uh, talk is twofold. Um, first one, like I said, introducing our CubeSat flight software design. Um, so this is a small satellite, but uh, it has a complex mission, as you'll see. Um, and I want to identify some of the benefits and limitations of CubeSat-oriented flight software. And then I'm going to discuss initial work on scaling um, the flight software up to a distributed constellation architecture. So enabling cooperative operations, specifically um, observations in a remote science, uh, remote um, Earth, remote sensing constellation, and then uh, maximizing autonomy and activity planning. Um, so going into the Murata flight software architecture, um, this mission is, uh, well, first of all, the acronym stands for Microwave Radiometer Technology Acceleration CubeSat. Um, we're funded by a NASA ESTO, so the Earth Science Technology Office, um, as well as, the, uh, as NOAA. And our launch is in early 2016, so we're building it now, and we just got through PDR, actually, this uh, past October. Um, it's a follow-on mission to a previous CubeSat that we built that's currently on the ISS, waiting for deployment. Um, there's been some difficulties with the deployment mechanism um, that, that wasn't ours. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of held things up, but that's, kind of, that's in the works now, and it should deploy early next year. So what the Micromass CubeSat did was it had a rotating radiometer payload that basically scanned Earth below and then looked into um, to deep space. I'm going to use deep space as a kind of calibration target. Um, what Murata, this new CubeSat is doing, uh, the picture is there in the bottom right, is taking uh, that radiometer and, and fixing it on the bus so it no longer rotates, but we're also adding another instrument, a GPS uh, receiver for a GPS radio occultation measurements. And I'll explain a little bit what those are in the next slide. But the, the important part to get here is that the radiometer instrument just looks down at, at the Earth, like a volume of atmosphere, below the CubeSat. And then we use GPS radio occultation measurements for calibrating the radiometer. And it's basically testing a new, a new method for calibrating uh, radiometers, because normally they have internal calibration targets that, are very, that drive the design of the system, and we're trying to kind of get it rid of that. Um, the developers are MIT Campus. We're developing the bus. Um, MIT Lincoln Lab um, is working on the radiometer payload, as well as um, kind of space vehicle integration. Um, the Aerospace Corporation is on the GPSRO payload, and then finally U UMass Amherst and Space Dynamics Laboratory are helping with the mission. Um, so the Murata space vehicle itself uh, looks like this. The top part is the payload. We have a tri-band microwave radiometer there at the top, um, and then a patched uh, antenna array for the GPS uh, receiver on the back of the satellite, which I guess I don't have a great picture of right now. But um, the bus is composed of an avionics stack, including our UHF radio, um, a spring tape antenna, our pumpkin pic 24 f motherboard, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but um, uh, an EPS uh, battery and some custom interface boards. And then we have uh, deployable solar panels and finally a, a basically a unitized um, ADCS module um, from the, the Mar Maryland Aerospace uh, Incorporated. It basically has reaction wheels, torque rods, um, uh, gy gyros, earth horizon sensors, sun sensors, all kind of incorporated into one unit. Um, so it uh, reduces kind of the complexity of our development process for the bus. Uh, so I wanted to touch on what GPS radio occultation measurements actually are. Um, and this is kind of a good illustration of it. Um, and basically, if you imagine that we're the satellite there on the far right, I know it doesn't look like a CubeSat, but imagine we are. Um, we are looking at signals coming from a GPS satellite way in the distance in MEO somewhere. Um, and those signals are passing through the Earth's atmosphere. And as they do, uh, they're basically affected by the refractivity of the atmosphere. So if you know, if you have precise timing, which you do because you're getting a GPS fix from your GPS receiver, um, then you can determine from your spacecraft when you see those signals, um, kind of a refractivity profile through the Earth's atmosphere. And that gives you information about temperature, pressure, volume, 
uh, that type of thing. And you can use that as calibration for the radiometer instrument. Um, and the way this actually, we actually do this calibration on Murata is with this slow um, pitch up maneuver. Um, so basically, you can imagine that we're coming over, uh, we're, we're coming from the left here. And, and that first step, we're just uh, looking at the Earth's atmosphere with the radiometer. And then we slowly pitch the spacecraft up. And as we pitch up to um, that final 110 kind of nominal degree pitch angle, we look back through that same volume of atmosphere with the GPSRO instrument. Um, so we're looking through the same volume of atmosphere. We, can, we looked at it with the radiometer, looked at it with the GPS. Uh, our own measurements, we can use it as a calibration source. This whole maneuver takes about 20 seconds um, and has a 0 0.5 kind of nominal uh, uh, degree per second rate. So this is, this is kind of a complex maneuver for such a small, <laughs> such a small satellite. And it's, um, I think, one of the most complicated things I've seen on a CubeSat uh, to date. So this is, designing for this maneuver is kind of part of the um, part of the, what we have to consider in the flight software design for our spacecraft. Um, and I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the, the concept of operations for how uh, the spacecraft will work and how that maneuver kind of fits in. So we have a launch via the um, educational launch of nanosatellites um, uh, program through NASA. Um, and that should be in early 2016. We're going to be in a 600 kilometer altitude sun synchronous orbit. Um, and uh, so that's our release, basically. So while we're in, while we're stowed on board um, the rocket that will release us, we basically are, we, the spacecraft is not on. Um, and we have, we have an early orbit activation phase where after we deploy from the spacecraft, the flight software turns on. And then we have to wait for 45 minutes um, before we can actually uh, start communicating and deploy solar panels. This is kind of standard for the way uh, CubeSats work. They have just like that. Uh, limitation. Um, and then we start our science operations. And our goal is to execute one of these calibration maneuvers um, that I just showed um, per orbit um, over a 90-day mission. And we currently only actually have one ground station um, that we're at least using for the Micromass mission, and that's kind of our baseline for, the, for this now new Murata mission. So we only have commanding at a certain time during the day, and then we have a gigantic blackout period where we can't communicate. Um, so that need to actually be able to execute these maneuvers once per orbit during times that we don't have, we haven't had communications, say, for up to 15 hours or so, um, has kind of significant implications for how we're going to actually um, operate the flight software. Um, and I guess I have some information down there below about our, our radios. Uh, the important point is just that we, when we have our ground station in sight, we have a 1.5 megabit per second downlink rate. And then we have a, a kind of secondary beacon that is just always actually sending packets through uh, the global star constellation, which is um, it's kind of nifty for a, a CubeSat. Um, and this is our early orbit activation sequence. Uh, we're going to be deployed from a P-pod deploy uh, orbital deployer. And then we um, during this initial phase, we have to inhibit communications, and um, we can't basically do anything with the spacecraft. And then we actually deploy solar panels and can start communicating. This, so this process going from inhibit to deploy after we release from the, the P-pod is just totally automated. Um, so we deploy solar panels um, using thermal, um, thermal knife devices, basically a burn wire. And then after we've deployed our solar panels, we go to a safe mode. Basically, the spacecraft just waits for, a, for an uplink from the ground to tell it to enter science operations. Um, and then the way our nominal kind of modes look, um, we start out in that safe mode. And then there's a ground command to transition to the normal kind of base um, operations mode for the spacecraft. Um, so that's kind of what we come back to whenever we're not actively doing a calibration slew maneuver um, or we're not downlinking to the ground station and such. Um, then we can do downlinks to the ground station. They're about 10 minutes, um, and that's initiated by the ground command from the ground station. And at the end of downlink, we transition back to a normal mode. Then we can do um, a maneuver. Uh, so this is... Basically, we uplink a command in advance to the spacecraft to tell it when we want it to do this maneuver. Um, and like I said, this could be at the end of a kind of a, a 
communications blackout period. Um, so you can imagine that we have kind of a queue of maneuvers uh, or a queue of commanded maneuvers that the spacecraft is waiting to do at, at any given time. Um, but when it starts a maneuver, it just transitions to this mode, and then it takes about 20 minutes, and it ends up back in normal mode. Then finally, because our, our spacecraft is, um, is not power positive in normal operations, we have to have a battery charging mode where we just point directly at the sun. And we don't have any, um, uh, we don't have any gimbaled solar panels because uh, it's you know, such a basic satellite. So we actually have to do course pointing, point the whole satellite at the sun. Um, and finally, at the end of... Oh, at the end of life, we have a decommission mode. Um, this slide just kind of summarizes our notion of, uh, of how we um, transition between these modes. Uh, we can do a maneuver and then kind of have a normal mode. And finally, um, maybe we'll have a downlink and then another normal mode, then battery charging. Um, and then that's on a typical science orbit. And then maybe on a typical non-science orbit, we have battery charging, normal, downlink, battery charging again after that. Um, so the implementation of, of all this um, is going to be on a PIC-24 microprocessor, um, which is fairly, uh, it's, I guess, fairly simple as far as microcontrollers for spacecraft go, or um, processors for spacecraft go. Um, we're getting both the processor and motherboard from Pumpkin Incorporated, which is a, a big kind of CubeSat part supplier. Um, it's a 16-bit processor um, running at 16 MIPS. It has 256K of... Uh, flash program memory, 96 kilobytes of data memory. So it's, it's fairly limited. Uh, we're actually building the flight software entirely in, in C. Um, and and it's, it, we don't actually have like a, a Linux distribution or anything on it. It's just all kind of a monolithic program. Uh, we're using a, a very basic uh, real-time operating system called Salvo. Um, it's basically a minimal memory use um, RTOS. So it, it's cooperative multitasking. When uh, we have multiple threads kind of running in parallel, and whenever one thread finishes with, uh, or a task, I should say, whenever one task finishes with the um, computations it wants to do for a given cycle, it says, well, I'm done for now, and another task can take over execution at this point. Um, yeah, and, and that our task provides some basic intercommunications, resource management, et cetera. Um, and the way our uh, flight software architecture uh, looks at this point, I'll just uh, kind of step through. Um, so th this is basically a diagram that includes a lot of our, our tasks in the flight software. Um, so we have this kind of central um, set of tasks that handle the kind of the high level management of the, the spacecraft. So there's, we have kind of a basic startup code, but then we have these three main tasks, housekeeping, um, the mission manager task, and a command handler task. So the mission manager task is responsible for implementing that state machine that I, that I showed earlier. Um, so the different operational modes, as well as um, commanding um, the payload to do what is necessary, as well as the ADCS to do uh, to slew when necessary for our calibration maneuvers. Um, the housekeeping task there at the top left just collects telemetry um, and packetizes that and gets that ready for downlinking to the ground. Uh, as well as assesses that telemetry and looks for faults um, to see if the watchdog timer needs to be petted, um, as it were. And then we have our uh, command handler task here at the bottom, which is responsible for um, accepting packets that come from our, um, from our radio driver task um, and figuring out whether those, where those commands should be put kind of on the queue. If, it's, if there's a kind of a preemptive command for like, entering safe mode, then that might be executed immediately. Um, otherwise, as I mentioned before, we have you know, calm blackout periods. Um, we might need to schedule multiple maneuvers in advance um, for all the orbits during that, that blackout period. So we have a queue, basically, where we're storing, um, it's basically a schedule for what uh, modes we want to execute at, at um, given times up to a certain kind of horizon, uh, planning horizon in the future. Um, then we have uh, an ADCS manager task that is in, in charge of communicating with the uh, Maryland Aerospace um, ADEX unit. Um, basically collects tele telemetry um, from the MAI as well as collects tele telemetry from the gyro. Um, and we have an, we've implemented a common filter and control law um, and everything just kind of 
in flight software, totally in C uh, within our flight software implementation. Um, then we have some more tasks that handle the uh, primary radio as well as the backup radio. Um, a payload driver task that interfaces with our payload. Um, and I guess I should call out that the, the mission manager has to manage that ADCS manager task as well as the payload driver task during a maneuver. Um, and finally, some more tasks for like the thermal knife drivers for deploying solar panels, um, uh, power distribution units, um, EPS, uh, and then uh, temperature sensor devices. Um, so that's kind of what this, the flight software architecture looks like at a high level. Um, so this is a slide on our current state. Um, I, I guess I'll just mention first off that I, I didn't dive into a lot of detail on how the software looks at this point because we're still at an early stage. Um, as I mentioned, we passed PDR, so a lot of what we've done so far is um, uh, architecting the system and making sure that uh, we'll be able to fulfill all of our requirements. And um, at this point going forward, there's a lot of coding to do. <laughs> um, fortunately, we have a lot of heritage from the previous CubeSat that we built, um, MicroMass. Um, they did a lot of driver development for that, um, a lot of... Uh, yeah, make, making the basic hardware interface that, um, that was on the system. And we're inheriting a lot of that, which is fortunate. Of course, we inherit the problems with that too, which weren't totally ironed out because um, on such a small program, or I guess on most programs, um, you get towards the end and you don't have the time to iron out all the problems in the software. Um, and then we're adding, uh, on top of that, um, the difficulties of scheduling these maneuvers um, during calm blackout periods, as well as more robust fault handling um, which we still kind of have to get into designing, as well as uh, reprogrammability. Um, so just hitting on the benefits um, and kind of limitations of this flight software implementation, um, one of the benefits, I would say, is the kind of the simplicity of it. Um, it. For more complex spacecraft, I think there's a lot more considerations that have to go into the design of the, the flight software um, for like an orbital insertion um, activity. but. Our spacecraft is kind of an always-on. Uh, well, it, it does it does science whenever that um, whenever that is available, and then the rest of the time it kind of waits for a downlink. Um, there's no kind of critical. Uh, there aren't very many critical phases that we have to go through, so that kind of simplifies. Um, that kind of lends itself to to a high level of automation. Uh, but some of the limitations here are um, little processing power with uh, the PIC24 and that we're kind of unable to do uh, complex activities because of that processing power. And that's kind of a direction that we want to head in the future, actually using a more capable processor and putting a, a Linux distribution of some sort on board. Um, so that was my kind of coverage of our, the flight software architecture for Murata. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, we're using that as, or I want to use that as inspiration for scaling up to a constellation of CubeSats. Um, so this first slide, there's a lot of detail on it, but I'm, I'm basically calling out the kind of uh, the motivation for why you want to build a, a coordinated constellation. But what I'm thinking about specifically is kind of remote sensing um, science applications in low Earth orbit. So the, there's these kind of sample cases here on the right. Um, in A, you might have two spacecraft with similar uh, payloads with similar instruments that are observing kind of the same volume of atmosphere. And they can look at that volume of atmosphere at the same time. And two instrument or two sources of measurements are better than just one. And B, this is kind of the Murata uh, application, where you have one instrument that is being uh, calibrated by another instrument. Um, and then C is a case where you have multiple um, different kinds of instruments that are all um, observing at the same time and kind of adding um, adding a lot a lot of synergistic uh, information in that way. Another potential benefit of constellations is um, spontaneous observation opportunities. Um, so basically, if you, if you have a spacecraft in one part of the constellation that sees an interesting event on, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, maybe a weather system of some sort, um, then it can notify other uh, satellites in the constellation about this interesting opportunity. And they can follow up immediately without having to uh, necessarily talk to the ground. Um, and then there's, a, on a constellation, you could have more effective downlink to ground stations by using it as kind of an ad hoc network, um, routing data through the constellation and um, 
and basically reducing latency by um, forwarding information to the CubeSat that is closest to a ground station at a certain time. Um, and so kind of the goal is to exploit the simplicity of a kind of a Murata architecture, um, that simple state machine, and scale it up to a distributed constellation of simple satellites um, with heterogeneous payloads. Um, but some of the challenges with this are, first of all, limited communications access to spacecraft, so communications backup periods, like I mentioned, um, and bandwidth limitations um, with, if you want to launch say, 100 spacecraft in a constellation, which <laughs> might not be too far out, um, then you're not going to have just infinite ability to, to communicate because of spectrum um, allocation uh, limitations. Um, if you want to actually coordinate these kind of, the second point, if you want to uh, coordinate these uh, calibration activities, um, say if you were using the Murata concept of operations, um, you have to consider kind of tight um, onboard uh, tight activity coupling between all the spacecraft. Um, so if spacecraft one wants to coordinate something with two, two with three, three with four, etc., um, going in forward in time, then if there's a problem on one, that might affect what two wants to do, which might affect what three wants to do, etc. Um, and how do you inform between these spacecraft that a plan update is necessary? There's limits on ground control interaction, so if we have this many spacecraft in a constellation, how do you actually have, you can't really have infinite human operators looking at, um, or doing sequencing, um, and looking at faults that uh, emerge on these satellites. Um, and then finally, uh, spontaneous events. If an event appears, uh, or if a new observation, interesting observation opportunity is spotted by one spacecraft, then how, um, how does it kind of reconcile that high priority observation with the previous um, plans that all the other spacecraft have uh, currently uh, planning on doing. So, so I've kind of identified a need for uh, onboard software to autonomously coordinate observations um, with as little um, grounds in the loop, um, yeah, with as little ground in the loop as, as possible. So in order to actually kind of solve this high level problem of how you um, coordinate all these operations on a constellation, I think we need to simplify the problem first. Um, so just kind of considering activity on board only two spacecraft. Um, so I'm looking at a two-agent scenario, um, kind of very simplified here into kind of a hardware um, and software test bed in which you have um, basically what I'm calling spacecraft agents in the middle here, which are just kind of webcams on a motor that, that kind of uh, slews around. And you can look at targets. Um, in, in this scenario, there's a reward for looking at targets um, jointly. So the two agents are kind of looking at a target at the same time, and that is kind of a proxy for a, co a coordinated observation in Earth orbit. Um, looking at a target generates data that you have to downlink, so there's a ground station target that they can look at. Um, and then you, all these activities take up energy, so there's an energy source that you have to look at to regenerate um, energy, effectively. Um, and there's, is it each of these agents has kind of a notion of an onboard state um, that includes energy storage, um, so like battery level, um, data storage, and momentum storage, so angular momentum storage, kind of a, a, a proxy for uh, reaction wheel angular momentum storage. Um, and then the agents can, the software on the two agents that plans their individual activities can cross-link with each other, uh, can talk to each other, uh, to share state information as well as you know their plans for activities in the future, um, but the problem with a real constellation is that you're going to have limited crosslink availability due to um, uh, due to orbital geometry constraints and um, bandwidth constraints. So there's sporadic availability of this crosslink. So um, so I'm designing an agent software that goes on both of these um, kind of two uh, these two microcontrollers controlling these uh, these web cameras so that um, it can maximize the amount of joint observation of targets while minimizing the staleness of shared state information between these two agents um, so now considering uh, planning on board to um, yeah. So given an initial plan of when you want these two agents to do a coordinated activity, um, and 
yeah, when they want to do a coordinated activity, how do you actually um, plan all of the activities that a single uh, spacecraft uh, or single agent needs to do in order to meet its onboard resource constraints? Um, that's kind of the, the part that I've, I've started with now. Um, so to, to, I guess, give some background on how that, that's formulated, this is a uh, state or a mode diagram or state machine for um, the operations of a single one of those agents. Uh, the activities at the top are basically these, these reward activities. There's target observation. That's when it's looking at one of those targets that I showed. Um, and crosslink, um, which gives state updates. So basically, you want to spend the most time in a target observation mode and minimize the time between a target observation and a crosslink um, to minimize that, that state, um, the staleness of that state information. These activities at the bottom are management activities. So um, desaturation desa uh, reduces stored angular momentum. Downlink reduces stored data. And recharge increases stored energy. And then finally, these two modes in the middle, SLU um, is, uh, is a way of representing that you have to uh, your spacecraft will be pointed at different attitudes for all these different activities. So you have to slew between different, um, different modes. And then idle is a, a lower resource utilization mode that kind of, yeah, you can serve as a, as a fill-in. So um, yeah, an example of kind of resource utilization and target observation is, is similar for kind of the other modes, is that you might have a power draw of 12 watts and a data rate of, or producing data at 35 kilobits per second and producing momentum at 20% every 15 minutes, at 20% of maximum storage. These numbers are based on um, actual uh, numbers from the Murata spacecraft uh, mission. Um, so you can generate, given the observations that you want to do and uh, the availability of observations due to um, uh, due to orbital geometry constraints um, and the availability of crosslinks, you can generate kind of an initial plan. So this is just showing for a single spacecraft agent um, in this demo, consider when it can observe and when, when it can actually crosslink with the other agent. So these are kind of the windows that it can do that. Then I'm adding in um, the times that it can actually downlink to a ground station and when it can recharge that purple line. Um, I probably should have had arrows pointing <laughs> specifically what these are. But you can generate an initial plan of activities for a single agent. Um, in this case, we just want to, the black line represents the initial plan. We want to um, ob observe when we possibly can, want to do a crosslink whenever we can, and then we have a slew mode between an observation and a crosslink, and just idle modes to kind of, uh, as placeholders, the rest of the time. So given this initial plan, you can introduce um, gradually other activities that are necessary to meet onboard resource utilization constraints. Again, that's energy, data, and angular momentum storage in this first um, formulation of the problem. Um, and that's, so I'm introducing a mixed integer linear program to solve that. Um, this line at the top is an objective function um, that uh, basically, in layman's terms, I'm trying to maximize the amount of time that w one of these agents um, spends observing, so it spends in, a, in its observation modes, and minimize the time between a crosslink and an observation. Again, for to keep state information as uh, uh, to minimize the staleness of it. But maximizing this function um, is subject to several constraints. First of all, that activities have to uh, follow each other. <laughs> And um, they have to start at time zero and end at t a, a horizon, a time horizon of planning. And then observation timing, say, for example, observation timing has to fit within the windows that um, observations are actually available to be executed. And the same kind of goes for downlink, crosslink, and recharge. Um, and then the spacecraft, ha spacecraft agent has to respect um, upper bounds and lower bounds on its resources. So this is just formulated in terms of energy storage. Um, it has to have, it has to maintain its energy storage above a lower bound at all times. So it's battery level below and a lower bound. And, sorry, above and a lower bound and below an upper bound. And same goes for data storage and momentum storage. So 
that's yeah, that's a lot of equations, and it might be kind of difficult to to fully uh, ingest all that just looking at the slide. But I have an example on the next slides of kind of how this works. So the the way we want to do it is take an initial plan of activities that's there at the top. That's just the same that I introduced on uh, a couple slides previous. And you see that given that initial plan. Um, resource utilization on this single spacecraft agent doesn't stay within bounds. So that blue line for energy storage at the top goes out of the red lines that are bounds on it. The same with data storage and the same with momentum storage. Um, and it makes sense. Energy storage, energy is taken up as you do these activities. Data is produced as you do these activities. And angular momentum is produced as you, as you transition between these activities. Um, so we want to first off say meet data storage requirements because da the windows for data uh, for downlinking to the ground are so limited. So we introduce say a downlink activity in this first um, in this first window for downlink. Um, hopefully you can see that downlink window, that blue line. Um, when we introduce that, all of a sudden our data storage um, resource utilization looks a bit better. We're not going out of the limits as much as possible, but we're still not quite meeting it. And note again that I'm solving the mixed energy linear program again. I'm just enforcing the constraints on data storage. Um, and so the the program is trying to trying to meet those constraints while also trying to maximize observation timing and minimize again the time between crosslinks and uh, and observations. The only problem is that even with totally minimizing the later observation times, like not even really doing an observation. Too much uh, data storage cannot, uh, limitations cannot be met. So let's try introducing a second downlink activity. And now all of a sudden data storage constraints can be met and we have a consistent plan. Um, so we've solved the, the mixed integer linear program uh, consistently. But we're still not quite there in terms of energy storage and momentum storage, so we add recharges. We're getting a more complicated plan, but now we meet both energy storage and data storage requirements. And then, satisfying the last constraints, we can add desaturation activities, again, to get rid of stored angular momentum. And now we have a plan uh, for a single agent's kind of timeline of activities um, that meets all resource constraints, and it's able to do those observations when, um, at the times that it negotiated with the other spacecraft agent, and it's able also to crosslink with the other spacecraft agent to reduce uncertainty um, in terms of its estimate of the state of the other agent. So we're we're done. Um, and that was kind of a that, that was the first step in actually doing the doing the planning process for a single agent. And my next steps are to, uh, well, my next steps are to actually incorporate that in with an algorithm that negotiates the timing of uh, observations and crosslinks between the two, uh, between the two spacecraft. So basically searching a giant tree to see where um, the optimum point is for, um, for the number of observations and number of crosslinks that can actually be done within in a certain uh, planning timeline. Um, so concluding, um, as I said, there are two distinct sections to this presentation, the Murata CubeSat software architecture section and the planning algorithm for a single spacecraft um, kind of scenario in a coordinated constellation. And uh, they s might seem kind of dis 